All right, now for something completely different. Still sticking in the 20s, however, which is why the 20th century was really the best uh, uh, century for art, because all of this exciting, famous stuff was happening all at the same time, all around the world. So many different ideas, so many famous paintings and painters to be generated from the beginning of the 20th century. It's so cool. And we're about to look at what I think is probably the coolest of all, my special favorite, new objectivity. New Objectivity was an art movement that came out of the Weimar Republic. What was the Weimar Republic? Well, those of you who have taken cultural connections with me, you better know what the Weimar Republic is. If you don't, I will come after you. I will hunt you down. I will find you. If you have done cultural connections and you do not know what the Weimar Republic is, you had better put yourself into the FBI Witness Protection Program. Otherwise, I am going to find you and I will kill you. Because, you remember guys, Weimar was our favorite. All right, for those of you who haven't done cultural connections with me, I will explain. The Weimar Republic is the name given to Germany between the wars, 1919 to 1933. The Weimar Republic, yeah, we still called it Germany, but the government um, that led Germany, this very left-wing government, was formed in the town of Weimar. So we call Germany during this period the Weimar Republic. And when people talk about the Weimar Republic, they really immediately think of the art and culture of Germany during this period. Now, as you all know, Germany lost World War I. And um, when the war ended, there was something called the Treaty of Versailles. This is where everybody got together the Allies and Germany, and they decided how Germany was going to be punished for losing the war, for uh, going to war with us and then losing. They had to be punished, right? And so the um, Treaty of Versailles basically crippled Germany financially. Germany had to pay, make reparation payments to all of the Axis countries, to France, to England, to America. It couldn't afford to do this and so America lent Germany the money to pay them back and all the other axes to make their reparation payments. Ridiculous in all ways. Basically the result of this is that Germany was plunged into her uh, beyond a depression. The country was bankrupt and um, as a result of this uh, it was a dark time for Germany in many ways. Um, a huge rise in prostitution, for example. People living very decadently. A lot of war wounded going around. People who had lost limbs or been horribly disformed in World War One, um, But there was no money to help them, um, to give them even prosthetic legs. You know, people who had lost their legs having to go around on little carts, pushing themselves along by their hands. A really depressing time economically and socially. But culturally, wow, an incredible time because so much came out of Weimar, Germany. And the painting that came out of Weimar, Germany, we call New Objectivity. And uh, the painting we're looking at now is a self-portrait by one of the New Objectivity painters called Christian Schad. What does objectivity mean? Well, when you look at, look at something objectively, you are not bringing to it any of your preconceived notions, right? New objectivity, when we're subjective about something, we bring our own sort of feelings into it and we imbue something, whatever it is, with qualities it may or may not have. The new objectivity painters, um, what they were trying to do was paint it as it was, to show the decadence, the suffering, the uh, sex, lots of sex, the uh, prostitution, the war wounded, basically to show the world, their world, the way that it really was. And by doing so, of course, they were completely subjective. That's the irony of it. But it's called New Objectivity. This guy, Christian Shad, self-portrait with a prostitute there. Believe me, I really don't think that Christian Shad wore creepy gauze all-in-ones like this, but he was painting himself as a sleazy character. Um, because 
There was a lot of sleazy characters in Weimar, Germany. Again, uh, this idea of new objectivity, showing things the way they really are, but not in a, a lifelike way, if you know what I mean. They weren't necessarily concerned with being realistic in terms of how they painted something, what finally appears. They were trying to be truthful about what things really are, even if they have to exaggerate them. Here is another self-portrait by Christian Schad with another prostitute, probably. And uh, you can see he didn't have a body like this. He wasn't deformed. In fact, he was very handsome. But he's showing himself as kind of morally deformed by painting this twisted, creepy ribcage. Um, a lot of prostitution. You know, people were so poor, a lot of women had to go into prostitution. And uh, the New Objectivity painters painted prostitutes constantly. Um, because it was a time of uh, this incredible sort of uh, uh, liberalism. The Weimar government was extremely left-wing and social conditions had really forced people into oh, kind of doing anything for, you know, a drink, for a piece of bread. It was a terrible time and you know what? A lot of people say that in 1933 the success of Mr. Adolf Hitler that unpleasant little arsehole and his uh, unpleasant little Nazi party, that their success may have been born out of this suffering and difficulty of the Weimar years. All right, and I want you to look at more of these uh, wonderful new objectivity paintings because when people like Christian Schad weren't painting prostitutes and the war wounded, they depicted nightlife in Berlin. Um, during the Weimar Republic, Germany really embraced modernism um, in a big way. A lot of so-called flappers running around. Um, and all of this was depicted, this nightlife, cabarets, in these paintings. Another artist I want you to be aware of from the Weimar Republic is Max Beckmann. Um, he kind of, in style, borrowed quite a bit from German Expressionism, kind of woodcutty, isn't it? But look what's going on here. He is showing a scene from the war years, which really haunted him. And there is somebody, some poor person, being both hanged and... What's happening? Is that a doctor doing something to his arm there? Who the hell knows? And then there is, you know, a prostitute tied up. So he's mixed Weimar Berlin in with some sort of horrific dream like uh, World War Two surgery tent. Um, Really kind of awful, scary imagery. He also did prostitutes. And again, take a look at his handling. Very, very uh, similar to what we saw Kirchner doing with German Expressionism. One of my favorites is this guy, George Gross. Look at the palette. It is red. What does red symbolize? It symbolizes danger. It symbolizes blood. It symbolizes death. Lots of red. This is, you know, downtown Berlin, and look what's happening here. It's kind of cubist in a way, his handling here. Um, but you, it's all going on here. Corrupt politicians, criminals, people committing suicide, prostitutes, nightlife, cabarets. It's all there. Uh, he had a good sense of humor, however. This is a, a great painting showing corruption, depicting corruption in Weimar, Germany. The three figures at the front here are politicians. And you can see one has a teacup on his head. One has uh, obviously somebody who, ah, it's a member of the Nazi party there in the front, who are the burgeoning new uh, political movement. And you can see in his brain he has, what, a, a, a soldier. Um, and then some other politician behind him who literally has shit for brains. If you take a look, his head's been cut off and there is poo there. Um, and then some sort of very corrupt, uh, terrible-looking clergyman behind the city on fire. Very political. And here is another very famous painting by George Gross. Again, please note this red, crimson, ver vermilion palette. And... Two people are committing suicide here. There's a guy hanging himself, and then the guy in the front has just shot himself. And then, look, in the window there is a prostitute. Behind the prostitute, a corrupt politician of some description. 
These were the themes because this was the reality of Weimar Germany and this is what these artists were trying to show. And slightly less depressing, Otto Dix. He really focused on uh, nightlife, on cabarets, on the new kind of independent woman who was coming out of Weimar Germany. Like her, she is called Sylvie von Harding and I thought you'd be interested in her because she was a fashion editor, very famous magazine editor who did a lot of fashion writing. And take a look first of all at her very modern dress, um, her short hair, her monocle, her cigarette, and also look at her hands. New objectivity artists always did these long, creepy, claw-like hands, but she is quite fab. And this lady, um, who was a nightclub singer and dancer, Again, note the palette, the vermilion, the crimson, the slinkiness of it all. And very stylized. These women weren't prostitutes. They were just well known on the Berlin scene. Hey guys, have any of you seen the movie Cabaret? If you haven't, watch it. It's great. It is a movie that is set in Weimar, Berlin. And it really shows you this, as it was known, divine decadence of the era. And take a look at that. This is from a fashion show where the models were uh, made up to look like Weimar paintings. And whenever we see uh, this kind of thing, women in fishnet tights, uh, these are wooden chairs, uh, sort of straddling these wooden chairs in sort of nightclub or cafe scenarios. It's a complete and very deliberate reference to Weimar Berlin. Things like this as well, um, sort of uh, kimonos and uh, stockings and corsets, um, completely cabaret, completely Weimar-esque, as is this. You can see it's the whole Weimar Berlin vibe, as is this, with the top hat and uh, corset and stockings a la Marlena Dietrich. Alright, moving to another location around the same time period, the Soviet Union. And we are going to talk about Soviet constructivism. Alright, even though you may not have heard the term Soviet constructivism, I am sure you have seen this kind of imagery. Let me explain. Soviet constructivism. Again, one of those terms that is going to freak you out if you are an art history undergrad, but you're not. So it's not going to freak you out because, you know, when you learn why it's called Soviet constructivism, um, there's nothing scary about it. Basically, as we all know, as I hope you know, the Ru Russian Revolution occurred in 1917. The Tsars were out. The royal family of Russia was out along with their lovely jewels, Fabergé eggs and winter palaces in was communism. The USSR was formed and of course Lenin was the big guy during this period and then of course Stalin would become the big guy, that asshole, horrible horrible man. This however, this period of the Soviet Union was uh, I guess uh, uh, challenging, very very challenging, in fact all of, all of the history of the Soviet Union was challenging. But, you know, uh, communism was based on this uh, egalitarian model, this idea that everyone is equal and should be working for Mother Russia, for the state. Soviet constructivist art basically means uh, stuff that is constructive. It's constructive for the state and it is based on propaganda. It borrows from Deco, um, a lot of geometry here, very stylized, very bold. And when we think of Soviet constructivism, we do think of its propaganda, these incredibly good looking posters. I have no idea what this worker is saying, but I'm sure it is something along the lines of let's work together for Mother Russia, for the state. Um, probably women workers of the Soviet Union unite. Um, Factories, industry, tractors, these were all at the heart of Soviet constructivist art. Again, another very stylized Soviet constructivist image here of a worker, a proud worker, in front of a factory here. 
Of course, when you think of Soviet constructivist colors, think of red and black. Another great piece of Soviet constructivist art here, some sort of propaganda poster. God knows what it's about, but there's Lenin at the top, and I am sure it all goes on in this Cyrillic uh, lettering to tell us all about how great communism is and how we must all work for improvement of the state and improvement of self um, to help Lenin. Um, great poster, and I really want you to see how much uh, typography plays a part in Soviet constructivist art. And here, I love this, I love this, because often photography would be used as well, but in this very collaged and stylized way. Again, I have no idea what this says, but you know as well as I do, it is about putting up your hands, put up your hands, hands coming together for the greater good. And of course, Soviet constructivism finds its place in contemporary fashion today, but also in graphic design. A couple of years ago, Saks Fifth Avenue did a whole advertising campaign based on Soviet constructivist propaganda. Want it. Um, it really was kind of ironic, wasn't it? Uh, this uh, says spring 2009, we had the terrible recession um, came about in the fall of 2008. So this really was Sachs's way of uh, playing with ideas of capitalism. Uh, because of course, communism is anti-capitalism. And so what Sachs did, they took this, uh, these communist templates and uh, applied them to capitalism. Want it. Arm yourself with fashion, with a slouchy bag. You can see, obviously, look at the colors, look at the typography completely inspired by Soviet constructivism, as is this flyer or poster for a club somewhere or a nightclub, energy, mix master, freaky, drop dead red. Again, I hope you can see why this is completely inspired by Soviet constructivism. Dadaism. Okay, this is fun. Dadaism came out of uh, kind of was a sort of almost a pan-European movement in the 20s, um, but mainly in Austria, Switzerland, a bit of Germany, Dadaism. Basically, Dadaism was about the absurd. It was about absurdity, about happenstance, about chance, about coincidence. It was about the absurdity of mankind. Underneath all of the absurdity, the word Dada doesn't even mean anything. Um, there was something very serious, um, a very serious thought. A lot of these young artists had lost loved ones, their pals, their friends, their brothers, in the trenches of World War I. And basically, they were saying, shit, you know, this is so absurd. The world is so absurd. Let's not even try to make any sense of it. If we can go into this brave new century and within a decade, um, the world goes to war and we use all of this new technology, cars and aeroplanes to make weapons and planes to drop bombs from, you know, who the hell are we? Mankind is effing absurd. Let's just focus on the absurd and try not even try to make sense of the world around us because there is no sense. In saying that, Dadaism is a lot of fun. It was mainly focused on collages. Well, a lot of it was focused on collages. Take a look at this Dada collage. It's completely absurd. It makes no sense. You can try as hard as you like to read some kind of narrative into Dada's collages, and you never, ever can, um, because they're intentionally absurd. Sometimes there were completely mental and deranged Dada is sculptures and paintings, like this sculpture here. Um, it's a, a wooden head and it has you know tape measure nail to it and a little shot glass and measuring cup it's just strange and silly and fun there was also dadaist literature and performance art i just want you to know about this guy he was a dadaist writer and performance artist called hugo ball and he performed on stage reciting his poetry dressed in this very interesting cardboard outfit and his most famous poem is this one. It's called Karawane. And I will try to recite a bit of it to you. Here we go. Hugo Ball, 1917, Karawane. Jolifanto bambler, ofali bambler, grossiga mumpfla 
Kabla Horam, Agiga Goraman, Higo Bloika Rasulo Hujo, Holaka Holaka, and Logo Bung, etc., etc. What language is Karawane written in? Well, I hope you realize this is no language at all. This is made up Dardarist language. It means nothing. The Dardarists were fun. They really were. They were really smart, really fun, really outrageous. And, of course, this absurdity, this Dardarism, makes its way into contemporary fashion all the time. Oh my God, take a look at that. This is Victor and Rolf's store. I think Victor and Rolf are very Dadaist. This is their store in Milan, which is completely upside down. Chairs are on the ceiling. The fireplace is on the ceiling. And I know it. in this picture it just simply looks like I put the image in upside down, but it's when you see somebody in this store, you can see the whole thing is upside down, totally Dada. Surrealism, going into the 1930s now. In the 30s, there was an obsession for the subconscious, for psychiatry, for the dream state. And surrealism was the art movement that echoed this interest in the subconscious. The most famous surrealist painter, I'm sure you have heard of him, is called Salvador Dali. And he did these very dreamlike canvases with melting watches and strange biomorphic animals. More talented, I think, and creepier was de Chirico. Did these kind of canvases, these strange towns and buildings with bizarre shadows and hallways that go on forever, really like in a bad, creepy dream? Much more fun was this guy, Magritte. Um, he was a surrealist, but a little bit more playful and less creepy. And he also did some sculptures like this, the famous... Uh, Magritte Surrealist Telephone, a telephone with a lobster um, for the uh, earpiece. Scaparelli was great friends with all of the Surrealists. She particularly liked Magritte because he was funny and fun and Scaparelli had a wonderful sense of humour. And in tribute to her friend Magritte, she did the famous lobster dress in the 1930s, which was most famous, famously worn by her. I hope you recognize her, Wallace Simpson, Mrs. Simpson, who went on to become uh, the Duchess of Windsor after King Edward abdicated the throne so he could marry her. Remember, you heard all about that when you saw the movie The King's Speech. And, of course, fashion today loves going back to surrealism. And you know what? I'm so glad it does, because don't we all want, from left to right, a skirt that looks like an umbrella, a hat that looks like a baguette with two corn on the cobs dangling from our hair and eggs all over our skirt. Don't we all want to walk around in a cage? And my goodness, do we not all want a hat that is also an eyeball that covers our face? Surrealism and fashion should never ever mix, but my god there are designers who just can't help themselves. But Slightly more useful, a more useful application for surrealism is in um, photo shoots, fashion layouts, etc., when it can be quite effective, this dreamlike state. All right, sticking with the 1930s. I want to talk to you about an art movement uh, predominantly associated with the 1930s, folk art. Now, of course, there had always been folk art. Art, you know, the very naive, simple, um, true, earthy artwork of the people. Um, there's always been folk art. But in the 1930s, folk art became fine art. It started to be regarded as fine art. And fine artist, when we talk about fine art, we're talking about, you know, things like, a, um, I don't know, Monet and Van Gogh, you know, fine art. Folk art, however, you know, it was the art of the people. It was never really regarded as proper art art or discussed by art critics or appearing in galleries or anything. This changed in the 1930s, and I really think the reason it changed is because of the Great Depression. The Great Depression was a tremendous leveller, and suddenly there was a focus on the real people. And uh, folk art became very trendy and started to be regarded, as I just said, as high art. I'm only going to talk about two folk artists because they're so famous. The first one is this guy, 
Diego Rivera. He was Mexican and he did a lot of very earthy themes. Flower sellers, farmers, peasants. He also was very political and did quite dramatic murals about, you know, workers and revolutions and this kind of thing. Um, he really was extremely talented, but painted in this intentionally naive way. Here is one of his spectacular murals. This is enormous. And take a look at what's going on here. Well, everything, everything's going on here, isn't it? You know, there's uh, military factions, there's workers, there's politicians, there's a... Uh, uh, native pre-Columbian uh, people here. There's knights on armor even. Um, it's really an incredible, incredible canvas. And uh, not canvas, mural, I'm sorry. And it's absolutely enormous. Oh, look, I just noticed for the first time there's some uh, monks there with their tonsures and farmers and, you know, earthy types and uh, revolutionaries and people of uh, various military factions, incredibly politicized. Um, and intentionally naive. Diego Rivera is really worth looking at further, really worth uh, studying, really worth seeing, but he will never be as famous as his wife. And I'm sure you can all recognize her. Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo. She was, uh, she is the poster girl for folk art. As you can see here, uh, Frida painted herself. That was her main uh, topic, actually, self-portraits. But she borrowed a lot from surrealism as well, as you will see. Her um, paintings, her self-portraits were very self-referential. They were very biographical, you know, discussing her various problems in life, um, heartache, loss, miscarriages, all kinds of stuff. Um, Frida chose to dress in the traditional garb of um, Mexico, in traditional folk clothing. When she wasn't wearing traditional folk clothing, she would wear a man's suit. She was bisexual. She was, and so sometimes she would um, be very masculine in her attire and wear men's suits. And other times she would dress in these incredibly colorful, beautiful, uh, pre-Columbian kind of uh, textiles and outfits, Native American uh, Mexican costume. She was famous for her unibrow. She did not believe in plucking her eyebrows. I wish she had, and she certainly didn't believe in waxing her upper lip, that's for sure. As I said before, she uh, borrowed a lot um, from the surrealist movement that was happening at the same time in Europe. And here is a self-portrait where she is a deer uh, being you know, being killed, being hunted with these arrows in her. She wasn't the happiest woman in the world, as I'm sure you can imagine. Here is a more, uh, I would say, more cheerful self-portrait, except if you look around her neck, she has this necklace made of thorns that's making her neck bleed. So it was really all about her psyche, her inner turmoils, as depicted with these outer uh, self-portrait images. Here, um, this painting, I believe, is called The Floating Bed, and it discusses her inability to have children. I think she painted this after one of her miscarriages, and you can see it's all very symbolic. It's kind of surreal. It's very disturbing. I am not a fan of Frida Kahlo at all. I mean, I think her stuff is just too weird and too dark, and also the whole unibrow and mustache thing turns me off. But this is what she looked like in real life. And you can see her self-portraits were, you know, although she did use the intentionally naive approach, they were actually pretty good. Very good self-likeness. This is a picture of Frida in the traditional garb of Mexico. These long, colorful skirts and flowers and headdresses and shawls. And needless to say, fashion is still in love with Frida Kahlo. So often in magazine editorials, photo shoots, you see Frida Kahlo getting referenced. I honestly think that whenever a stylist or a fashion editor or a photographer is confronted with anything colorful, when in doubt, do Frida Kahlo. And again, and again, this one with a parrot, because she was often with a parrot or a monkey on her shoulder. And again, so much Frida Kahlo everywhere.
and again. When in doubt, do Frida Kahlo. I am so bored with seeing Frida Kahlo imagery in magazines. I say the only time it's okay to reference Frida Kahlo is if you need a costume for your dog for Halloween. Don't you love this? Look, I just love it. This dog, when is it? Well, I don't even know what kind of dog that is. But I love the way the unibrow has been painted on. So, Frida Kahlo, great to use for a Halloween costume for a dog or a baby. Is that not the cutest? Look at this little baby going to Halloween as Frida Kahlo with the unibrow and the monkey on the shoulder. Great fun. All right, now we are going to go into the late 1940s after World War II. Now, there wasn't a, an art movement associated with World War II. There wasn't much art produced during that era. Can anyone figure out why? Yes, because the world was at war. We were fighting fascism in Europe. We were fighting imperialism in the East. The world was completely at war and people had better things to think about and worry about than creating art. That changed in the post-war period, late 40s, throughout the 1950s, with an art movement I am sure you have heard of, Abstract Expressionism. Okay, what does, the, what does it mean, Abstract Expressionism? Well, abstract, meaning that it doesn't depict anything, and Expressionism, meaning that the artist literally used the canvas as a way to express inner emotions. I'm only going to talk about the super uber most famous of all abstract expressionists. Starting with this guy, I am sure you have heard of him, Jackson Pollock. Here is another Pollock canvas. What Jackson Pollock did, he had these enormous canvases that he'd lay on the floor, and then he would walk across them with his bucket of paint, a paintbrush, and he would splatter all of these colors and paint onto these canvases in these great sweeping gestures. His technique of painting is known as gestural art. This is when the whole body is kind of employed into putting the um, paint on a canvas. You're going to be looking at a lot of gestural art as we move through the latter part of the 20th century. Um, so he would do all of this splattered paint very dramatically. He would throw cigarette butts into, uh, into the, the paint or onto the canvas. He'd throw sand onto it. He was a big alcoholic, so he'd be drinking from a bottle of bourbon. Then he'd smash the bottle of bourbon and he'd throw the glass onto the canvas, which gives all of his work kind of a glittery, um, radiant look. Um, there's lots of Jackson Pollock at MoMA. There's a whole gallery devoted to him, if you're interested in seeing this stuff in real life. What was he trying to do? What he was trying to get out his inner demons. He was trying to get out, you know, all of this inner psyche onto his canvas with these great sweeping gestures um, of paint, with his paintbrush onto this canvas. And of course, fashion loves Jackson Pollock. Take a look at this pair of wedges, take a look at this dress, completely inspired by Jackson Pollock. As is this, as is this, Pollock. So now you know. Take a look at this fashion layout, completely Pollock-esque. A slightly more pretty abstract expressionist painter is this guy, Kandinsky. Take a look. Sometimes it's easy to confuse Kandinsky with the Orphism painters. Remember Robert and Sonia Delaunay because they use a very similar palette. Um, however, they are different. And um, Kandinsky, I think, uh, again, he was expressing his own inner emotions here. But he um, definitely did uh, uh, sort of have a dialogue with the earlier Orphics. You see here these beautiful orbs. He was about colour. He was all about the vibrat vibratory meaning of colour and what colour does to the soul when you look at it. And it's really very pretty. I like Kandinsky. And so does fashion. Take a look at these colours. Take a look at the background. Completely Kandinsky. As is this. A little bit silly, but lovely colours. And as is this scarf, obviously directly drawn from Kandinsky. So, you know, you could talk about some collection in terms of a palette inspired by Kandinsky. 
even if the designer wasn't referencing Kandinsky at all and did it all subconsciously, you can still bring in Kandinsky and his palette or his shapes as a, a vocabulary for your own writing. Ah, here's a very Kandinsky-esque necklace for you. And these Kandinsky bangles, it's all very Kandinsky. This guy you may have heard of, Mark Rothko, he was an American. And what he did was an entire career of these canvases, um, which had, I guess he was the original color blocker, right? Color blocking. Can, uh, these canvases that were um, sectioned off using these blocks of color. They don't really look like much when I show them like this or when you see them in a book, but when you see them in real life, they are extraordinarily, extraordinarily beautiful. They're very spiritual in nature, according to Rothko anyway. The edges of all of these colored boxes he did with this sort of feathering technique using a very, very fine paintbrush. So when you sit in front of a Rothko and you look at it, and you look at these boxes, because of the feathering technique, the colors start to sort of vibrate. Very strange, almost like an optical illusion. Very peaceful. Here's another one. He always used very soft colors, interesting colors, and he did this for years and years and years. It never got old with Mark, Mark Rothko. And here are some fashion images, which I hope you can see are inspired by Rothko. Especially this dress that Michelle Obama wore. Um, I think the day that uh, uh, Obama won the, his, his first election, I think. Um, inspired, of course, by Mark Rothko. All right, who's this guy? Yves Klein. Okay, I know it looks like he's called Yves Klein, but you say Klein. Klein. It's not easy to say, probably. Yves Klein. If you want to say Yves Klein, you can, but it's better to say Yves Klein because he was French. Abstract Expressionism, although it started in America, was a, 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 an international movement. And Yves Klein invented this color. Yves Klein Blue. YK Blue, it's known as. And DuPont actually patented it for him. This lovely blue. And he loved it. He loved this blue. Sometimes he liked gold as well. But mainly he liked blue. This YKB, YK blue, which was his signature color. Here, you can see what he's done. Maybe you can, maybe he, you, you can't. He got a model to, uh, uh, he dipped a female model in Eve Clown blue and she rolled. You can see this lady rolled on a, a long, long, long sheet of paper. And you can see those two sort of uh, bumps at the top, like the Mickey Mouse ears are actually her boobs. And then you see her torso and you see her legs. She sort of, he made a stencil out of her with Eve Klein Blue. Sometimes he would just paint a sculpture with Eve Klein Blue. He loved this blue. And sometimes he would just take a canvas and uh, make a very textural abstract painting with YK Blue. It is a wonderful blue, and he was obsessed with it. And so is fashion today. So often a designer will use YK Blue um, as their signature color in a collection. And so when talking about this color, call it YK Blue or Eclat Blue, because that is what it is. All right. There's Yves Klein, and then there's Franz Klein. Very similar names, very different paintings, but both abstract expressionist. Uh, Franz Klein, as you can see here, he was a gestural painter. He made these huge sweeping gestures of black paint on a white canvas. And again here, if you're looking for variety with uh, Klein, don't hold your breath, because basically this is all he did. But he is extremely famous. He is a very well-known abstract expressionist. Now, although he didn't work in color, Yves Klein, Yves Klein did. Um, in a way, Yves Klein did work in color because he saw black and white as colors, um, which they are, of course. We don't think of them as color, but they are. Rothko, um, various other artists who just focused on color, they are known as the color field painters. 
people who really focused on colour. Rothko particularly is a colour field painter. Yves Klein is a colour field painter. There are some who would say that Klein was a colour field painter. However, I think he's more of a gestural painter, although of course you can be both. Abstract expressionism encompassed everything. So look at these huge, bold strokes, almost like some kind of Japanese writing, although of course it's not, that Klein did. And you can see how in love with him fashion still is for print. Time and time again it goes back to Franz Klein. Pop art, I know you have all heard of pop art and I know you all love it, but what you probably don't know, okay, pop art, we're looking at the uh, late 1950s and 1960s, we think of it as being so American, but in fact, pop art started in England. Pop art was originally an English art movement in the 1950s, late 40s, beginning of the 50s, um, and included artists like this guy, Richard Hamilton. Now, this is a collage by Richard Hamilton, which has a great title. And the title is, let me see if I get this right, just what is it about modern life that is so attractive and appealing? Or something like that. Um, the title really sounded like uh, the copy from a woman's magazine. And what he has done here, he has collaged together all of these very American elements here. Um, there is uh, Johnny Weissmiller, the, you know, the, the muscle man Tarzan there, holding a lollipop. In the back on the wall, Young Romance magazine. Um, there's an enormous ham there, a television, uh, a woman with a vacuum cleaner. These were all American things. The 1950s in America was a very prosperous time. However, England was still rationed. It was a very difficult time for England. And so what the British pop artists did, they were both making fun of America, but with a kind of envy. Uh, they, they were envious of America and admitted it. They loved American things, but didn't have American things. So, um, it was a celebration of the post-war world, but ironically. Here is another wonderful image by Richard Hamilton collaged together. This ultra 60s, sort of 50s, early 60s looking woman. Another British pop artist from the first wave of pop art is Eduardo Paolozzi. Not easy to say. He was Italian in origin, but one of the English pop art crowd. And here you can see he's done very similar uh, work to Hamilton by collaging all of these very American images together. Lucille Ball, Orange Juice, a tin of tuna, um, Minnie Mouse. And again, here we go, another Eduardo Poluzzi um, image here, collaging together all of these various American elements. It's fun, it's colorful, it's great. But my favorite British pop artist is this guy, Peter Blake. This is a big wooden panel where he has painted these red, white, and blue chevrons on the bottom part and on the top part. It's very, very large, this panel. There's a single, a 45, and all of these images cut out of magazines of American rock and roll idols. This um, panel painting is called Got a Girl, and you can see the title is over there also collaged onto the panel. He was a really fine painter. He was a great painter. And here is a very famous painting by Peter Blake called Self-Portrait with Badgers. And there he is, a little tubby English guy, and he's painted himself in head-to-toe denim like an American with basketball shoes and on his um, denim jacket all of these badges, or buttons as you call them in America. Here is another Peter Blake um, canvas panel, call it what you will, it's called Tuesday, and you can see he's taken images from American magazines and collaged them and painted the bottom half. I love his stuff. He really is one of my top five favorite artists. Another great uh, piece of Peter Blake pop art. Look at the colors. Babe Rainbow is what it's called. Isn't it great? But you probably know him best for designing the cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, one of the most famous album covers in the history of, of the music industry, and it was by Peter Blake, this artist we've been discussing. Of course, pop art was soon embraced in America, 
And uh, the artist I want to talk to you about first, is he really a pop artist? Is he something else? Is he something in between? Who the heck knows? He kind of stands alone and he is one of the greatest artists of the 20th century and his name is Robert Rauschenberg. Have you heard that name? I hope you have. He is one of you guys. He is an American. He is Robert Rauschenberg and I love him. He is so important. He took a lot of pop imagery and again we're talking, you know, 50s and 60s here. This is obviously from the early 60s. You can see what's going on here. He's got Kennedy. He's got the American Eagle um, below his name there that I stupidly, you know, stuck all over this canvas. There is a, a helicopter, some images from the space race. It was sort of half painted, half collaged. What Rauschenberg liked to do would be to take an image from a magazine, um, sort of paste it onto a canvas and then peel it off so only the ghostly image remained. Um, he wanted to render visible the invisible. He played with the void. What wasn't there was as important to Rauschenberg as what was there, which is what lends his, his uh, paintings this very kind of ghostly, almost eerie quality. Here is another gorgeous example of Rauschenberg, or Rauschy as I like to call him, um, where he stuck photographs and headlines and magazine clippings onto a canvas which he's painted on and then he's pulled, a, pulled some of the pictures off so they leave a ghostly image. Now this isn't a very uh, good photograph of this I'm afraid. But you see there's like a strip of uh, images going across this canvas. If you look at the bottom part of the strip, you see all of these colors, these little sort of uh, rectangles of colors. What they were were actually uh, paint swatches. You know when you go in to buy paint, you can get those uh, swatches that you leave through? Well, he got one of those little booklets and he cut them out and he stuck all of these colors along. I think it's beautiful. What about you? Another example of Rauschenberg. I hope you're getting a read on what his work looks like. He's still around, he's still painting, or he was by the time I was uh, putting this uh, PowerPoint together. Here is another very famous Rauschenberg. This is called The Bed. It's his bed. Basically one morning he got up and he uh, nailed his bed and bedding to a, a wooden board and he painted over it. I think it's great looking. I think it's gorgeous. This is not Rauschenberg. This, which I'm sure you've seen, is by his boyfriend of the time, Jasper Johns. Yes, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg were both extremely famous pop artists and they were boyfriends. And they lived together, they shared a studio, and sometimes they would have lover's tiffs where one of them would walk over to the other guy's side of the studio and uh, ruin one of his canvases, throw paint at it or something. So they had quite a volatile relationship, but they both inspired each other. They had a very different kind of uh, uh, approach. Actually, they had a very similar approach, I think. The end result, though, was very different. Jasper Johns was famous for doing American flags and targets. On his American flags, he would paint them, and then he would put a layer of wax over them. So the wax would kind of peel off, and so some of the, the color would peel off. So again, he's kind of painting what isn't there. The absence of presence, the presence of absence, all of these kind of uh, concepts that his boyfriend was working with. Targets as well. He loved doing targets. He did tons of targets. Sometimes he would uh, incorporate them into sculptural pieces like this one with these faces above it. And, you know, usually he did put this layer of wax over his work. Lots of Rauschenberg at MoMA, lots of Jasper John at uh, uh, MoMA. Go and see these dudes. They are fun. They are good. I know you know this guy, Roy Lichtenstein. Now, he was a painter. Keep that in mind. But he tried to make his painting really look like a, a printed image. There were those tiny little dots. So, in a way, Lichtenstein did his own type of pointillism, didn't he? Um, although... It looks and is just completely copied from uh, comic books. There was a political message behind Lichtenstein's work. It was really all to do with the Cold War, Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis, etc. Um, he really worked with irony as much as everything else. But this really is hardcore art theory when you start looking at Lichtenstein's work in terms of the Cold War. And we're not getting bogged down in that. 
I just want you to be aware of his name, because I know you're aware of this guy's name, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol mainly did silk screens. You all know what a silk screen is, right? It's a method of printing where you um, use the same screen to print different colours. Um, and they usually come out like this. You know, colours spilling out where they're not supposed to. This is what Andy Warhol liked. He also liked painting and silk screening Campbell's tomato soup cans. What was Andy Warhol all about? Well, he was about reproduction. What fascinated him was the lack of anything original. And what is originality? This is what he was asking himself. Is that Marilyn Monroe we see? Uh, I'll just do this again. Is this Marilyn Monroe? Is this a silk screen of Marilyn Monroe? The more times we reproduce Marilyn Monroe, does she become less Marilyn Monroe? Is this an original Andy Warhol? Well, I don't know. He made this silk screen, but he made this silk screen from a photograph that somebody else took. And then the more times uh, the silk screen was used, did it become less Warhol or more Warhol? What, what about if one of his assistants made a silk screen? Is that less Warhol? Is it Marilyn? Is it not Marilyn? These are the ideas that Warhol was playing with. He wasn't just making pretty pictures. He was dealing with big concepts about the 20th century, about originality, about reproduction. Um, and the reason that he chose such iconic things like Marilyn Monroe or Elizabeth Taylor or Campbell's soup cans is because in our homes we all already have this image. We all have a can of tomato soup. Somewhere in all of our houses, be it in a book or even on the internet, we all have an image of Marilyn Monroe. So the more times we see her, is she less original or more original? Is she less Monroe or more Monroe? Or if she's done by Warhol, is it, is it a Marilyn Monroe or is it an Andy Warhol? These are the concepts that Andy Warhol was playing with. And is this a banana or is it a Warhol banana? Well, of course, that is his logo. That is the Warhol banana. Do I even have to explain why this collection is inspired by pop art and Liechtenstein in particular. Look at the models' faces with these little dots on them. Whenever you see something fun and bold and silly, it's probably inspired by pop art. As is this. <laughs> Obviously, as is this. As is this. As is this. Of course, everybody wants to wear this. My God. But again, inspired by Warhol, particularly this time. As is this. Inspired by Liechtenstein, this one. <sighs> yep, Liechtenstein. So you all know what pop art is, but now I think I hopefully have explained it to you a little more clearly. So that you know that behind these very iconic pop culture images and colourful... Uh, pictures that we see on a million tote bags, there was actually quite an intellectual drive behind it. All right, at the same time, 1960s, as pop art, there was op art. Okay, op art came out of the 60s, and I'm sure you know what the op stood for. Optical. Black and white only, these kind of optical illusions that were painted is really extraordinary. These were not computer generated. These were painted. And most of them were painted by this lady, Bridget Riley. She was the main op artist um, and really the only name in op art you need to know. But it is a name you do need to know because she kind of invented the movement and was the main proponent of it. So op art were, were these sort of uh, um, incredible black and white paintings that created these optical illusions, very psychedelic, really, because don't forget this was the era when people were experimenting with drugs and things, too. Hand fashion loves op art. Look at all of these recent fashion images, and I hope you can see why they are, they are inspired by op art. And here is an entire collection. It's really very elegant of op art-inspired clothing. And is it me? Am I nuts? But does the model at the front look exactly like Daniel Radcliffe? I think so. 
All right, going into the 70s now, and we see the start of postmodernism. Postmodernism that would dominate the art world in the 70s and 80s and beyond. We're still kind of living in a postmodern world. Post meaning after, modernism meaning after. You know, what came next? Basically, postmodernism was about taking art and deconstructing it and being ironic with it. And um, there is no one particular look for postmodernism, but it was really kind of about deconstructing all of our notions of art in the 20th century. And the most famous postmodernist, at least the most uh, well-paid one, is this guy, Julian Schnabel. Here is one of his canvases. He also liked to do things with broken plates. Here is a Julian Schnabel portrait with broken plates. Here is another Julian Schnabel painting very deconstructed, isn't it? Um, for me, Julian Schnabel is a bit hit and miss. Sometimes I, I like his stuff because it's really quite impressive when you see it in real life and some of it's enormous and I think some of it's really beautiful. Other, other examples I think are rubbish. Maybe that's what postmodernism is all about. But of course, fashion loves Julian Schnabel. Here is a Julian Schnabel. Uh, painting on the left and uh, not a good image there but it was the only one I could find a collection inspired by Julian Schnabel's very postmodern paintings. This guy I'm sure you've heard of, Jean-Pierre Basquiat. He was a postmodernist operating in the late 70s through the 80s and this is what Basquiat looked like and as you can see he was very hip, he was very cute, he had a big drug problem and so because of all of these things um, being hip and cute and addicted to heroin made him a, a very saleable painter. Postmodernism is really when we start seeing um, art prices ricocheting through the roof. Don't forget the 80s was the time of the haves and the have-nots. A lot of people made an awful lot of money and they spent it on art and they loved postmodern art. Here is an example, again, of Jean-Pierre Basquiat. He died of a drug overdose, of course, when he was very, very young. And uh, this just meant his paintings sold for even more. They were very colorful. They kind of uh, made a social commentary. They deconstructed all of the notions about art. They borrowed a little bit from graffiti art. Um, they're not unattractive. I'm not a fan, um, but he is very, very popular. Here is another Basquiat. And, of course, Basquiat inspired fashion. And again, this kind of scribbly writing, these bright colors, these uh, smudges of paint, these weird, anamorphic, almost monstrous-looking people that populate Basquiat's landscape. Keith Haring, I know you know this guy. Is he a postmodernist? I don't know. I just didn't really know where else to put him because he kind of stood alone. He started off as a graffiti artist doing these strange little stenciled men. And, of course, being the 1980s, he was seized upon by the art world who ricocheted him into incredible fame as a fine artist. You can see he liked doing these little, very happy and positive dancing figures. Keith Haring sadly died very young from AIDS. He was one of the first famous people to die of AIDS. And uh, here, a little glowing baby. Um, again, another one of his, his very, very iconic little shapes. All of um, the proceeds, or a great deal of the proceeds, uh, generated from Keith Haring's work today. And we all, we've seen this stuff, haven't we, on tote bags and cups and t-shirts. A great deal um, goes to AIDS research and uh, various charities involved in HIV or caring for people with AIDS internationally. So something really good comes out of these positive images that Keith Haring devoted his artistic endeavors towards. And of course, in fashion, Fashion loves Keith Haring. I particularly like those shoes on the left there with the little glowing baby as the heel. All right, uh, one of the sub-movements of postmodernism is something that, for some crazy reason, I really like. 
It came out of Italy in the 70s, going into the 80s, and is called Arte Povera, which literally means poor art. Poor art, um, as in the materials that were used, were humble, I think, more than that it was actually poor in quality. Um, but what the Arte Povera artist did were things like this, a pile of rags with a statue in front of them. What does it all mean? Well, it all means a lot of stuff, really, but I think it looks good. The Arte Povera artists would do odd things like get bags of sand and then put neon lettering around them. Or they'd get a cabbage, a decaying cabbage, and they'd stick an electrode in it and um, an electric light. Basically, an electric light bulb in a cabbage is what I think of when I think of Arte Povera. And things like this. I think this is weirdly great looking. All of these rags piled up and then a wall made out of rags. So it's really all about sort of taking existing elements, rags, cabbages, neon, electricity, and putting them together in this bizarre way. So when you see fashion-wise stuff like this, or this, or this, I think you can and should describe it as arte povera, or inspired by arte povera, or if the designer hasn't intentionally been inspired by something, you can say it evokes Arte Povera. I think it does, do you? All right, we have to talk about graffiti art. All right, graffiti art. I think you all know what it is and what it looks like, and it has been around for a very long time now. Um, it's been around since the late 1970s. I don't like it. I don't like it, and I don't want you guys to think, oh, Prof H doesn't like graffiti art because she's old and she's a square. That's bullshit. I am no square. I just admitted to liking Arte Povera, which, let's be honest, is borderline shit, but I like it. I just don't like the way graffiti art looks. I don't like the look of this stuff. Um, I think it's a technique that has learned. You learn of this technique. Like doing bubble writing, you learn how to do it. And then once this has been learned and mastered, you can go out and you can do it. I don't think it really takes much creative talent or artistic ability to be a graffiti artist. I also think that there is no, uh, the reasons for doing graffiti um, are far less noble today. Uh, before people started being paid for graffiti, there was a kind of noble meaning behind it, slightly in the 70s going into the 80s because it really was political expression. It was political expression. It was um, a message and it was tied in with hip hop and uh, the message was about the conditions in the boroughs, in the inner cities for the African American population which were you know, shameful. Um, I mean, kindergartens with rats in them, things like that. And I'm not even exaggerating. I lived for a short spell in New York in the early 1980s and to tell you to kind of describe how much New York has changed and improved and how much conditions have improved in the boroughs in the inner city is uh, it's it's hard for me to find the words it's hard for me to find the words um, to describe what um, a bleak landscape it was especially if you were a 19 year old African-American guy living in the Bronx or living in Brooklyn your prospects were not good. Nobody was helping you. Um, to better understand what life was like, go and listen to the song The Message by Grandmaster Flash. You all know it. It's like a jungle out there. Sometimes I wonder how I keep from going under. If you look at the lyrics, he really does an excellent job of describing life in the boroughs, in the New York boroughs, in the early 1980s. People on heroin, people peeing and pooing in the streets. Um, really a bad scene. And so graffiti was a way of getting the message. I mean, it's no accident that Grandmaster Flash calls his iconic song The Message. Getting the message out there. Out there as to what life was truly like. And this message traveled. It traveled on the subways. Subways were the main uh, canvas, if you will, for graffiti artists. Now, people have said to me, you guys. Oh, Prof H, it must have been so cool 
The subway is covered with graffiti in the early 80s. Wow, that must have been so cool. It wasn't cool at all. It was scary. This is what it looked like. It was horrible. This is a subway station. Yeah, it's all lit up here with a flash photography, but it didn't look good. It was scary. Angry, angry young men were doing this because they had been shat upon by society. They had every right to be angry, and their anger came out in their graffiti. It wasn't a pleasant environment for anyone, for anyone. And so it's kind of ironic, I always think, when there was this moment of change in graffiti, which was a very legitimate and quite noble form of protest, suddenly became regarded as fine art and put into galleries. Talk about the irony. Especially when you, you, you think about who was buying graffiti art as art. It was those rich yuppies in the 80s, you know, the Wall Street crowd, etc., who had earned, amassed all of this money. Well, uh, so many people were uh, uh, victims of all of this kind of trickle-down economics and suffering terribly. So there's like an irony and something kind of distasteful about it all. And so I do not like graffiti, but mainly I don't like the way it looks. Uh, here's some more ironic graffiti in a gallery. But I do like Banksy. Banksy sprung up uh, in London in, I guess, the, the late 90s. And he did very, very clever stencils that used the architecture to tell the story. Like here we have a maid lifting up sort of a curtain and you see the wall behind it and that's the real wall. Banksy was very and is very political um, in nature. His artwork really had a message and for ages we didn't know who he was because he was so secret and covert. I want change. Keep your coins. I want change. Another great piece of very political Banksy stenciling. And here, how political is this? You have these uh, two very iconic American images, Mickey Mouse and Ronald McDonald. And between them, of course, you might recognize that little Vietnamese girl, a cull from the very famous painting of um, a, a terrible scene in the Vietnam War. So again, Banksy being very political, making uh, comments here about American isolationism, um, etc. And he also sort of made a lot of statements in his stencils just about the state of the world. Look, what are you looking at? This is stenciled by one of these uh, uh, cameras that are everywhere now watching our every move. So again, to me it's very ironic that Banksy who, whose whole uh, purpose in his stenciling was to go against the establishment, suddenly became part of the establishment here. Huge retrospective uh, on Banksy. Bristol Museum, it's a very posh museum, the establishment, versus Banksy. But of course, Bristol Museum isn't versus Banksy, is it? Banksy is willingly exhibiting there and getting lots of money for it. And boy, does Banksy... Uh, uh, get a lot of money. These, whoops, just go back. This uh, is one of his stencils. This is a print, and a signed Banksy print can sell now for sort of $250,000 for a print. There is an irony here that is so enormous and so weird, and it kind of pisses me off. I've got nothing against Banksy, you know, I think that he's good and clever and kind of fun and ironic and he had a political message and yet he is brought into the very establishment that he set out to mock and raise awareness of with his stencils. So uh, it's all very weird and I think it's, uh, he's a great example of people buying stuff just because it's trendy. People who can afford it will happily spend $150,000 on a Banksy print. But they wouldn't spend that on a beautiful Rauschenberg painting or one of those fabulous Peter Blake panels. They probably even wouldn't spend it on a Picasso. No, they spend it on Banksy because he's momentarily trendy. And of course, I don't even have to tell you about how graffiti art and stenciling and all of this has worked its way into fashion and has done for the past 30 years. It's never going away, is it? We always see graffiti, hip-hop kind of... Uh, uh, statements on the runway in magazines and in retail. 
even at the very highest end. The irony here, here is of course the Vuitton Graffiti range and the whole point of graffiti was to highlight the differences um, in life and opportunity for pe from, between people who could afford to buy Vuitton and people who were living in uh, the boroughs. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And here again, some more graffiti-inspired stuff. And again, some stenciling here, very bank All right, just as a side note, I want to tell you about this artist operating today. Very notorious, but he's a household name. And if you haven't heard from him, you need to know who he is. He's called Damien Hurst. He's English. And this is the kind of stuff he does. This is a shark, a real shark that has been preserved in some kind of formaldehyde and sectioned. This is a cow he did the same thing too. He got a calf, he cut it in half. And then each half was put into these rather kind of elegant uh, glass cubes with, I guess, some sort of solution, uh, preserving solution inside. And that's what this calf looks like from the side. People were outraged, some people love it, some people hate it. I don't know what I think. The jury's still out. I think the shark is kind of beautiful. I don't want to see the inside of a cow. Um, this is another incredible piece by Damien Hurst. It's a skull, a 17th century human skull, covered with, I think, about 8,000 diamonds, real diamonds. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Some people say you shouldn't fool with calves and, and sharks and skulls of people who really existed. The reason Damien Hurst does all of this is because he thinks it looks good. He thinks it's beautiful. And I know he sounds like he'd be a very scary, weird, dark person, but actually he's fun. There's Damien Hurst there just having a bit of fun, kissing his skull. He's really quite a fun, lively person who does a lot for charity and um, is very involved in kind of the, the London art scene. And he does not see himself as an anti-establishment person at all. And in fact, he's not. He's really become part of the art establishment. So art today, where does it stand at this very moment? Well, because of computers, we now have computer art, don't we? Computer generated art, where anything at all is possible. I can take a photograph of this guy. Some of you might know him. This is Django Halle. He is my cat. This is a photograph of Django Halle. And just on PowerPoint, with the various filters and effects, I can make him impressionist. I can make him a pointillist. I can make him pop art. I can make him cubist. I can even turn him into a pre-Raphaelite stunner. I don't think he will ever forgive me for this image. So really, we are all potential artists now, aren't we? Well, I hope that this uh, quite long lecture has made you realize that no matter what happens in the world, whatever happened in the world, art matters. Art isn't just a, a luxury, it's a necessity. Human beings have always needed it. It's part of what we need to survive. Never forget that art matters. And so does fashion. And the conversation between the two has gone back and forth for decades, and it still will. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, lecture. I hope you've learned a lot, and I hope it inspires you to either create some art or go out and look at some. I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.